Okay, Ivan, uh, first of all, a huge congratulations for Team Uzbekistan winning the gold medal. Um, Thanks a lot, feeling? Sakar. Yeah, it's good. Time is now passing by. The time to analyze everything and to focus on some new endeavors. Uh, this is uh, what usually life uh, of a sportsman is about. So, so you are right now in uh, UAE, yes? Yes. So, have you already moved on to the next endeavor or uh, you are just uh, still thinking uh, of Well, actually, I did, uh, of course, think about this past uh, well event and, of course, analyzed it a bit in my mind. And uh, I realized, actually, this is from something magnificent because many times it could have, due to different reasons, uh, gone wrong. And it finished, actually, right. And uh, tomorrow I'm actually flying uh, to Tashkent. They called me for a meeting. I think that uh, the idea is to discuss uh, the future cooperation. And, uh, well, then uh, I'm, I will stay there only uh, two nights. And then I'm flying back to Amsterdam. And then I will, have a, I will fly to Croatia, to Zagreb, to conduct a trainer seminar. And when I'm done with this, I will have another trainer seminar in Mamaya during the World uh, World Youth. I think what is happening there. So there is something uh, to be done coming. And by the end of the year, I also plan to actually finish uh, uh, one of the books, which is either winning chess middle games for E4 structures, or the second book on Magnus. Wow! I was actually supposed to have done uh, both of those works uh, uh, by the end of this year. But, uh, well, this is not exactly going to happen. Mm. And because, okay, it's this uh, when I was making these uh, plans and arrangements, I did not expect, uh, let's say, this uh, assignment with Uzbekistan team. Right. And, okay, this assignment included that, uh, first of all, I was there almost three weeks in Tashkent. And also during the Olympiad that, okay, that I was busy with the team preparation. So this is not exactly the same like when you're a commentator and you don't prepare for anything. You enter the studio, you follow the game, start talking. When the games are finished, you close the studio. And in the morning, you can do whatever you like. Right. So this kind of assignment made that I cannot finish both of the projects by the end of the year but I will finish one of them. So it's a very busy period for you. But uh, coming back to the stint with the Uzbekistan team, how did it all begin? Uh, who was the one who reached out to you for it? Well, it actually started uh, relatively recently. It started uh, during the Sharjah Masters. So during the Sharjah Masters, all of them, they played there. Uh, all team, because... All uh, hmm. Yes. I think, no, I think that Jahangir, no, Jahangir, I think, did not play. Mm. But all the other four did play. Okay. And uh, there with them was uh, as a sort of, uh, okay, I would not call it, well, maybe sort of head of delegation, but also he was an arbiter in the event in Sharjah Masters, who signed to the leave. And he kind of, uh, he reached out to me there. He asked me, what are my plans uh, during the Olympiad? Actually, he asked me, do I have uh, assignment at Olympiad? And I told him that I sort of do, that uh, I'm more or less finalizing agreement with the media team to be a commentator mm -hmm. at Olympiad. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, okay, that... For me, as a uh, as a trainer, as a chess professional, it is more challenging, let's say, to coach team like Uzbekistan rather than to be a commentator. Okay. And then when this offer came, I called actually Nihal Sarin, and I told him, "Look, something a little bit changed because." Uh, Vishal uh, Sarin, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, Vishal. Sorry, Vishal. Right. I call. Yeah, Vishal. <laughs> I, I said, "Look, Vishal, something's." Uh, uh, changed and uh, well I'm sure you will be able to find some other commentator but on the other hand this is for me professionally much more interesting mm -hmm. and okay he understood this so this was not uh, not an issue 
And this is more or less how it started. But okay, Sharjah, so this was not so long ago. Right. So then after the Sharjah Masters, I started to look up at the games of those players. And okay, we fixed this uh, uh, training session in a Tashkent. And I came there. And okay, then I just came back home for a few days to change the suitcases. And uh, well, then uh, direction Chennai. Right. So, so practically, you can say that three weeks with the team and then two weeks at the event. That's how yes. long it was yes. your stint with them. Uh, sort of, but okay, a little bit longer because I didn't come exactly, let's say, to Tashkent with empty hands. Because when I was coming there, I right, did analyze the games of the players. And, mm-hmm. I actually, and I had actually, the moment I came, I had already formed some sort of starting opinion. Right. Obviously, to analyze uh, games, so to have a look at the games of somebody in a chess base and to actually analyze with a person and to interact opinions is not the same thing. Okay. You learn much more about person when you are inter- interacting with a person over the board, but uh, based on, uh, well, my analysis of the games of a chess base, I had uh, already some kind of, of idea. Uh, how do they do they play? What are uh, weak spots? Maybe, uh, well, spots to improve on, and those sort of ideas I had at the time when I was actually flying to Tashkent. Right, right. Uh, because you are not someone who sort of minces with his words, I can ask you, uh, and I want to go through each player. But we can start with who you think is the most talented out of all five of them, according to you. Uh, it is difficult to uh, look uh, to judge. Uh, I always used to say that okay, t- people have many talents, and uh, some something is more talent. Somebody is more talented for somebody than somebody else uh, in one area, but not in the other. So let's say, probably, uh, I think that. Uh, Abdul Satarov has actually in his style many similarities to Magnus Carlsen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sindarov is very tactical, but okay, he needs to improve knowledge about uh, many type of positions coming from different kind of openings, which he doesn't have at this particular moment, in order to improve further but obviously extremely talented player because uh, uh, now after working with him I sort of I do know he's let's say weak areas and regardless of those weak areas uh, well he has achieved a lot so mm-hmm. obviously extremely talented player uh, uh, Bortu Yak- Yak- Yakuboev he's quite let's say uh, universal he's reasonably uh, rounded in uh, most of the areas of the game. Uh, Shemsuddin Wahidov, he is still not much known to people out of Uzbekistan because he's young and he played very few events which are uh, outside. Played, okay, many online events, but many people are playing online events. You normally don't get noticed by playing online events. Hmm. And uh, Jahon Kir, which was uh, one of the heroes, or maybe the hero of this Olympiad for Uzbekistan team, he's the one which is uh, older than the yes. rest of them. Yeah, he's, he's 27. actually yes, he's only one that is uh, considerably older than the rest of them. The rest of them are uh, okay. Most of people probably would be very surprised that uh, Abdul Satarov, with his results, that he's uh, still seventeen, right? Which is. Uh, I think to a lot of people it will come as a surprise. So a very young team with a definitely, I mean, a lot of potential. Let's put it this way. I have no idea whether this team is going to win the Olympia two years from now. Mm. But I know that uh, the team will be stronger two years from now. So when you when you took on this job uh, and when you took on the task of training them, did you have an aim for the Olympia? Uh, okay, I had a name and I was getting constantly asked while I was in a Tashkent, do we have a chance to win a medal? <laughs> and obviously I was not crazy. I didn't want to pick up any kind of, let's say, 
psychological burden. And I told them that this is simply not realistic. Because I said, look, analyze team by team. We are number 14. Okay, team is underrated. I told them it's the start. I said, look, now after this uh, almost three weeks and analyzing the games, I'm sure the team is underrated. Mm. How much underrated? Okay, this I don't know. It is. Uh, this is very difficult to say how much underrated, but it is underrated. But let's say, okay, we are underrated that we are not supposed to be number 14. We are supposed to be number nine. Okay, then let's analyze the top eight. Uh, where are we exactly better than there are on which board? And, uh, well, then it's easy to come to conclusion that, let's say, top five would have been fantastic achievement. Mm, true. Uh, in the Olympia, the way it went itself, uh, of course, look, I did not expect, let's say, United States to perform to its, uh, to its full capability. Why? Because they simply do not look like a team. Mm. But uh, what I thought, I thought, well, uh, they are somehow so much more experienced and so much better than the rest of the team that, uh, well, pure difference in class is supposed to do the job. So I was thinking that America will simply win. Mm. Because by the pure difference in class, I thought, okay, maybe, you know, maybe team as a team perhaps will not, uh, will maybe win uh, combined only two or three rating points. But uh, who cares? It can be enough just to win the Olympiad. Right. Uh, if everybody on his board makes uh, his expected TPR, probably that team is going to win the Olympiad. Right. Uh, I got very optimistic when I saw that uh, Gukas is not in India 1. Mm. That that made me very happy. Because I thought I told to my players, I said, okay, this is very good news. Because instead of uh, uh, undisputed uh, huge talent, they are putting uh, a guy who is just a little bit younger than me. Uh, this, this made me quite optimistic. Mm. But okay, there were many teams and uh, just... Uh, Plenty of teams that I also told to my players, uh, I don't know if those teams are, you know, better than us, but uh, they're also not worse. Uh, let's say maybe we have a decent chance, but they also have at least 50% chance. Just analyze board by board. So, yeah, it is kind of massive results. I was, I was hoping for something, but... Uh, at the start of it, uh, I think that I was quite fair when I told the people from Federation that uh, top five would be fantastic. Mm. And what do you think went the way of Uzbekistan and went your way during the event? Uh, because, you know, to finish with the gold medal is a simply a tremendous performance. Well, sometime around uh, on the rest day, I started to actually get optimistic that, uh, first of all, that we even will a medal. And that maybe this medal can be even higher than bronze. Because by that time, after six rounds has passed, it was very obvious that with the United States team, something is really wrong. Mm. And it was a big question mark if they would win a medal at all, any kind of medal. And the rest of the teams, okay, the rest of the teams, yeah, were performing kind of okay. But uh, uh, we were also performing very okay. And there were a number of teams, let's say, that was very clear, are now off the radar for any meaningful result. For example, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians were having very big problems. They already had a number of matches that went uh, wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when you have a team that uh, uh, Korobo was not in a great form, and you have a team that doesn't have a leader, it is uh, already somehow something is wrong. Uh, Norway had a great leader, but Magnus could not play a simul. If he could play <laughs> simul, probably Norway would do better as a team. Uh, so, uh, pre-tournament potential, maybe let's say, maybe Norway was also a potential dark horse, because if a uh, world champion plays according to expectation, and he did, 
well, the rest is quite a decent team. Mm. But something, but a lot of things were wrong with them because the only thing which was good with them is that Manuels was winning all those games. But uh, the rest, they had many problems. Uh, Poland was having problems. This was also potential potential candidate for a medal in my mind before the Olympiad. Okay, they have this young player Duda, super talent who is sitting on a board one. The rest of the team is pretty good. Okay, mm. they have Wojtaszek with all his knowledge and experience. Uh, I was thinking, okay, Poland on a good day, they, they can also be contender. Right. So there were a number of those potential contenders already actually that were kind of sort of uh, dropping off uh, halfway the Olympiad because also then their tie break was starting to look uh, pretty grim. So by that time, I was actually getting optimistic that uh, it uh, could be a medal. And what was good for us is that actually our tie break was almost from the very start mm. extremely good. Yeah. So any kind of tie should be okay for us. So, so before the event began, you said you worked with these players and you went through this their games. So what was your work that you did before the event? And then during the event as well, because I think there are two types of roles. One is the hardcore sort of analytical part. Uh, and these are usually like, let's say in India, you had a main trainer and then you had a couple of uh, seconds who would then do the hard bit of uh, analysis of variations and opening analysis for the team. So were you also doing that? And uh, how was your role before the event and during the event? Well, my role before the event was actually to improve the level of play by uh, putting different kind of, let's say, positions which are coming from type of positions which are coming from different kind of uh, middle games, coming from different openings, and to try to improve knowledge on this. And the many of the test positions like decision-making process, mm -hmm. which this decision-making process could be on a different things. Yeah. Uh, so th th then this decision making process okay decision making process is sometimes going to uh, have to do with finding the right plan or finding the right trade or uh, pure calculation let's put it this way that uh, uh, i keep on working on my databases all the time and try to adjust them also to modern games and these decision making processes coming from a different kind of positions different kind of games but it's more like, okay, take a decision between the limited amount of time, which uh, well does improve your playing skills. And also it is improving uh, your knowledge about different kind of positions. I do not have this, uh, let's say, when I try to do this, I do have a different kind of, let's say, databases, which sometimes it, it is a decision made on calculations, sometimes it's decision making on the right trade, sometimes it's decision make on the pawn breaks. And when I'm putting this to a players to try to improve their knowledge in this decision making process, of course, examples are coming from all these kind of areas. Mm -hmm. But I never systemize them to a player like, okay, we are now going to be busy with this and busy with that. That why? Because during the game, nobody would say, hey, do the right trade. Uh, or yes, end game is good for you. No, you have a position. Uh, it is, let's say, in that game was move 28. Is it fair to say at that time that you would not have too much time on the clock? Yes, it is fair to say. Is it fair to say that maybe you should take a decision between 12 to 15 minutes because you would not have oceans of time? Play would also say, okay, it is fair to say, okay. Uh, time is starting. So this is a end up. I had uh, also with them many kind of openings idea which I had on my own. Uh, and but normally I would say, look, uh, don't expect me uh, to run cloud on some sort of crazy depth because okay, I don't like it. Mm. I was not doing this when I was active player myself, and I will not go. I'm not going to do it for you. Uh, so, but I have some kind of let's say ideas which I think, okay, uh, eight out of ten computer is going to refute, mm. but maybe those two out of ten would be very doable. 
So, okay, I give you the ideas and then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, run your, run your cloud and then, okay, tell me what you found. Mm -hmm. You are not against them running the cloud. You just don't want yourself to do it. Correct. Mm -hmm. No, look, in a modern chess, uh, you need to do it. Uh, so this was in this, let's say, uh, pre time. And, uh, but you say, of course, in a modern chess, look, you have to, I mean, use the computers. You have to run a cloud. You, you cannot, uh, uh, avoid this. And of course, I mean, uh, to check this out, they simply have to do it. I mean, thanks God I didn't have to do it in my time. <laughs> uh, and then you during let's say during a tournament you have uh, the right uh, opening versus the right player so i was not uh, preparing them let's say novelties before the game i was not doing this i was not doing this with iran either mm. uh, but what i would have i would have i would let's say say like okay uh, tomorrow we are playing this opponent. In 90% of the cases, let's say, board 1 and 2, you sort of knew. If they are going to change something, they'll be on the last two boards. Mm -hmm. Most of the teams, maybe not 90%, let's say 75% is fair to say. Correct. Uh, okay, anyhow, 10 minutes past 10, you would know the exact uh, opponent every mm -hmm. morning. So, usually... I would give them the timings. Uh, when every single one should either give to my room, come to my room, or to call me. Uh, I would say, okay, send me some message. What do you want to play today? What do you expect? What do you want to play? Or call me or send me WhatsApp or send me email, whatever. And then what I will do, I will open up my database, a uh, regular chess base tree. And I will see well whether I expect the same thing what my player is expecting, whether I expect the same reaction, and whether I think what my player wants to do, let's say, is a smart thing to do versus that kind of opponent. So, for example, okay, just to give you an idea, uh, I did not predict, let's say, that Wesley Saw versus Sindarov is going to play first move h4. I mean, on Greenfield would play h4 on third move. Mm. But uh, uh, Sindara was somehow that day the last in line of my questionnaire with the players one by one. And he said, well, he gave me some lines versus e4. And he said, okay, this with this and this and this. I said, look, but I think that Wesley Saw will not play against e4. Uh, oh, he said, really? I said, yes, that's what I think. Uh, and then I told him, okay, he would probably play move uh, knight f3 because you're not doing so well against Anti Grunfeld. And he said, yeah, but okay, I can always play c5. I said, yeah, you can. True, you can. But then he can get you into Sicilian, which you are not planning to play today. And then suddenly, okay, he understood that it can be a problem there. Uh, so it was with a number of, uh, in a number of, uh, situations, what to try to get, what to try to avoid. So like, for example, when we played uh, India two, mm -hmm. I was very unhappy about the position that, uh, Sindarov got versus Pragrananda after the opening, yes. not because, not because white was having some tremendous, uh, advantage. But okay, this is typical kind of position that Pragananda is very happy about. Mm. Uh, technical play. White is on a very safe side. It is not like this uh, King's Indian mating attack of that kind of stuff. Okay, if black is playing very well, probably black is going to equalize at some stage and make a draw, but it is very easy to actually slip. Mm. And I was, for example, this position which they got was actually exactly the kind of positions I was hoping that type of positions they are not going to get. So, right. you know, when we were, for example, my player number two, uh, I advised him to play that ending which he got versus Nihal Sarin. Mm -hmm. 
And first he was against it. He said, yes, but Michal Sarin is very good in the endings. Right. I said, yes, Michal Sarin is excellent in endings, but he's better. When he's worse, he's slightly less good. Mm. Uh, so this kind of type of work is uh, what I was, uh, let's say, doing before with Iran, also what I was not, not doing with them. So I would not like kind of... Uh, uh, not sleep and let my cloud run and try to give them some kind of crushing novelty. No, this is not what I was doing. And I told them also at the start, this is not what I'm going to do. Uh, but what, what I will do, I can help you with my experience as a player and as a coach to choose the right opening, the right decision versus the right guy. And to compare my own anticipation with your anticipation as to what is likely to appear on the board. So, so why didn't you choose this approach where you both would like the you and your player would sit together and anticipate? Why would you ask them to first anticipate on their own and then check it? Was it like trying to make them more independent? Uh, first of all, this. Secondly, uh, I have always opinion when I come to the players. I said, well, uh, every one of your own can spend more time of preparation that I can spend because I have four of you. I don't have one player. Uh, when I was working with the Salem, it was different. I have one player. Hmm. Completely different, but I have now four players. Right. So I said, well, in order for our preparation to be efficient, you cannot come to me like tabula rasa. Uh, you have to come to me already with some sort of idea what is going to happen. Okay, then I will I, I will have a look and come back to you with uh, my vision. And then still you are going to have a little bit of time to work a little bit more on this. If you come to me like first in the morning, okay, you will have then more time. Maybe you would have still one more hour to think about this or one and a half hour. If you like to, if you come to me, if you are the number four in this line, you would have a little bit less time. But okay, then you have more time to work on this in the morning. But Something like this, because uh, when you have a team of uh, four players and, uh, well, how much time can you allocate per player? Mm. 45 minutes maximum, right? right? You cannot allocate more right? unless you, you plan uh, not to sleep at night, mm. which in that case, okay, they will need somebody else, not me. But... Uh, if you are kind of willing to spend the normal time, you have normally like approximately 45, 45 minutes per player. And that means if you have 45 minutes per player is that, uh, okay, player should have some kind of idea of what he wants to achieve on a board. Mm -hmm. Because then I have myself maybe, let's say, 20, 25 minutes to make my own analysis in a quick this database tree to kind of understand whether this is objective expectation and another maybe it's okay 20 25 minutes to kind of uh, discuss with the player okay this is the right uh, the right choice right. or sometimes okay if i have done uh, i had it also a number of occasions that i said look uh, i think this is a uh, good stuff to try and i think i have decent idea on it i'm going to send you my file mm -hmm. And you run your cloud on this file. Okay, it could be that I'm blundering something because I will tell them, look, I don't, all of those files, I don't use cloud, but I use, okay, regular Stockfish, which with maybe depth, let's say, average 31, 32. Okay, this is not like uh, perfection, but this is actually already kind of pretty strong. Mm. This is stronger than any human, including Will champion so it is already kind of uh, quite high mm. and uh, this is what what i also had a number of time and okay sometimes player would say okay i follow it sometimes player would say well i find it too complicated to kind of prepare it uh, in a short period of time right but, but thank you for the file i will do it on some other occasion so these files which you would prepare for openings as well as for decision making is like a year long process, right? Even when you are not training, yes. you are collecting them, you are uh, building things up maybe for a project like this or. Uh... Yeah. 
so it's so it's a year long work which is amazing that you are all the time working but it is uh, look it is it is normal if you are a, a practical player you're also all the time working when some uh, tournament took place i mean what do you do you do go normally to either to week in chess so you go to online chess base uh, or i don't know use use something else and you update uh, with yes. the newest games but they are professional players and you are no longer a professional player yet you keep yourself updated well because i'm professional coach mm. so like for example uh, what sindarov played uh, in a two games a game versus uh, uh armenia and the game versus uh, netherlands this bishop d3 line versus uh, neidorf mm -hmm. okay it started what one and a half year ago right something like this it is recent uh, of recent time uh and well i'm obviously not an expert there i mean why should i be expert there but uh, i have pretty good idea about those games which are played and what kind of position may appear on the board right so i told let's say to before our match versus netherlands i told to sindarov uh repeat the same line hmm. he said yeah but okay now he would prepare i said okay he can prepare and what would he exactly prepare because uh, at the current point of time the exact answer for a black is not established right it is not like that people have found one straight line that is eliminating uh, into equality at this moment black players are trying different lines and engine is giving you 0 0.2 in uh, all those lines uh you don't have exact uh, direct line of play like in some other nighters and uh, also if somebody played it only once why would somebody anticipate he would play it uh, again and let's say for a person who likes to sit and take his time like a bok perfect choice uh okay sindarov did not win a game mm. but he was very close right he was very close to me so this is let's say more or less uh, a type of work which I try to do. I try to, let's say, uh, uh, help those players uh, using the advantages of my strong points. Mm. Because uh, I do not, look, I'm 54 and I have this uh, massive experience. But if uh, I don't think that my uh, forte, that my strongest points are in uh, searching for some novelty or move 22 or right. 18 or whatever so i'm trying to help them using uh, the advantages uh, which work with me is bringing and to let them do some other part of work by themselves right uh, what would you say about the team spirit of uh, of the entire team were they all very close to each other uh, you have also trained uh, iranian team before do you find similarities between the two yes yeah, definitely similarities because you have a, a very young people that are willing to achieve a massive result and let's put it this way that they are uh, uh, maybe maybe they are just uh, still too young you know that uh, elements uh, like uh, envy jealously and so on and so on become actually an obstacle to a team success mm. so yes in both cases actually i would say that uh, very strong team spirit and a good relationship with each other did certainly add a number of uh, i mean quite a sizable ELO, number of elo points to its uh, performance yeah yeah i mean uh, all of them gained elo points in this event i think total of 65 elo points which uh, is team, amazing team no team in total gained uh, around 80 80 80 zero that's a lot yeah which is a lot which is a massive gain yeah
and did you have any trouble with the language barriers speaking with them because not all of them are very fluent with, in <coughs> english uh no i did not have because okay so, uh it was uh, i was speaking to them combination of uh, english and russian mm. so it was basically working and I, I have also two players who speak excellent English. Well, one is Jahan Kirvakido because he studied right. in the UK. And Abdus Satarov also speaks very good English. Yes. So sometimes if there was really these problems that uh, they could not exactly follow to the full my English and my Russian was not good enough to express myself, then they would jump as the translators. Mm. So it was not, uh, not, not an issue. Last time when you had uh, mentioned, uh, we had in had interviewed you. You had mentioned about Firuja. He was twenty five eighty, and you said he reminds you of young Vishy Anand. And within couple of years, in spite of the pandemic, he reached twenty eight hundred. Uh, and you know he was in the candidates. This time you have uh, said that uh, Abdul Satarov reminds you of uh, young Magnus, uh, or you can say Magnus in general. Magnus, yeah. Yeah. So um, does do you think that you see a similar trend for for this boy as well. Uh, yes, I think that uh, he no he certainly has a, a lot of similarities uh, uh, to Magnus. A lot of similarities, like uh, uh, excellent calculation. But on the other hand, just like Magnus, he doesn't want to enter this uh, you know crazy Ta like position or Shiro like position, sacrificing a house. This is not what he wants. Mm. Uh, active player, predominantly style, active positional style. Right. Uh, I mean, active play, but uh, on a sound, uh, on a sound basis. Very good technique. I mean, that technique even Magnus felt himself losing that technical position. In World about, rapid. Uh, yes, correct, because. Not many people on this planet can beat Magnus in a such a technical Absolutely. way. Yeah. If you would be, if you not know the names, you would th be thinking it is the other way around. Uh, so, absolutely, you know, massive talent and talent in development. He is still only seventeen, mm. and then you have Sindaro with a different kind of talent. Very tactical, I, yes. Sindaro... Very tactical, and I think that if he can, uh, uh, if he can improve on some other areas of chess or if he can like i told him work more and be less lazy uh i think that he can achieve a lot but it is up to him because uh, like i said you have many many talents and ability to maybe play some technical position strong strong or to play some tactical position very strong is just one part of uh, that talent and what you're going to do with the rest of this well rests uh, to you and the board too uh, Yakuboev uh, not much is known about him because when Sindarov became a GM he was around 12 years and few months so he became well known because of that Nadir Beck we all know young talent also he won the world rapid but Yakuboev very uh, solid on board too unbeaten um, uh, what would you say are his yeah, he's a little bit uh, less known, indeed, than, than those players, because, okay, he be, he's slightly older than them, slightly. So, still a very young player, and rather, let's say, universal player. And he works a lot, also works a lot on a kind of areas where many young players are not working. So just trying to improve uh, the chess, not only being interested about uh, most promising opening variation. Mm. And I see for him also, you know, a great future. And uh, the other young player, uh, okay, Shamsuddin Wokhidov, I think that he will need to to play more, also to play more outside of... Uh, Uzbekistan outside of this kind of area so that he will become more known and also to gain more experience and knowledge but he's uh, you know 
he's dynamic player with the dynamic player with the, let's say also sound positional fundament you can see this for example in his uh, okay he brought us very important win versus Sasikiran yes and uh, it was uh, for a long time balanced game mm. and at some stage he got the advantage and he handled this advantage uh, very well he never let it go he never let it go yeah. And then, okay, the question, of course, can be, for example, it was obvious if he wants to win a game, he needs to push F5 at some stage to get right. those pawns rolling. Uh, maybe his timing, you know, was greatest because he didn't want to push this F5 uh, very soon after the time control. He made mm. a break moment when Sasikiran was in a severe time pressure. Absolutely. Moment when he made a break, uh, maybe Sasikiran had two minutes or something mm. like this for the rest of the game. So this was a very important uh, win for us uh, uh, yes. in, in the tournament. But this was, for example, also when experience somehow helps because I told him, okay, his initial idea was to play E5. And I told him, play the Sicilian. Because I said, look, if you want to play E5, you're playing some classical Spanish with the black. Uh, something which Sasikiran is playing all his life with black. Right. Uh, so I'm not saying that you cannot outplay him of course you can outplay him but it is fair to say that about those positions he probably knows much more than you which doesn't need to manifest in that one game but uh, why to look for the trouble there mm. and I said you know it is much I, I told him I said look it is much more maybe a better idea to play Sicilian because uh, you would put him into a little bit different situation Number one is he would need to maybe remember a lot of lines. And it's not very obvious what he does versus neither with white, even though he loves to play it sometimes with black. But it is not clear what he does with white. And okay, anti Sicilian, he can play anti Sicilian. But then he has already, let's say, taken, uh, has given you small psychological advantage. Right. I explained, I compared to this, I said, look, uh, uh, that famous game that I won versus Kasparov, the moment when he played second move E6, I was already a little bit happy because at that time he was playing only in Grunfeld. So, okay, he gives you some very small, very small psychological mm. head start. So the moment in that game where Sasikiran went for this rather unusual anti-Sicilian, uh, obviously White can still fight for advantage there, and game just started. Right. But he gave he gave to Black a small psychological head start. Absolutely. And I saw you in the event uh, very emotional, like you know when especially India two game when Nadir Beck saved that game against Gukesh. You were just, you went to him, you hugged him, you know, like sort of patted him on the back. Uh, I think you were totally 100% involved, yes? Uh, I simply don't understand coaches who are reading your books. This is really, for me, difficult to understand. Because, okay, you are involved with your team. Next to your team, you have some other games which are taking place. Uh it is not very likely that you will find the time when the game is over to go to website of the tournament, download all the games and to go through them. Highly unlikely that you are going to find this time. But okay, if you're walking around, you would maybe spot five, six interesting games that you would say, okay, this I'm actually, I'm going to download and tomorrow have a brief look just to figure out, is there some novelty? Is there something very special going on? And this match versus India 2 was actually a special match in a way that uh, it was played at a very light, late stage uh, of a tournament. Right. And it's okay, what can I say? At some moment, I had absolutely zero doubt it will be 3-1. Mm. Uh, I even told uh, our Chess Federation president arrived there and I said, okay, this match is, you know, in nobody resigned, but... Uh, I do not see any other result uh, apart from 3-1 because, okay, those two positions are so hopeless. Uh, 
And then I started to get actually some a glimmer of hope when uh, Prague was having some problems converting uh, advantage. So it was very clear that, uh, okay, he's a very strong player and he's maybe going to win it over the board. But on the other hand, it was also clear that he doesn't know descending by heart because he was spending time uh, and dropping on time. Mm. So by the moment when he dropped to something like four minutes, I kind of thought, okay, if he drops another two or three minutes, you know, who knows? Maybe he is going to let it slip. When you have dropped to such a low time, uh, even when you are extremely strong, uh, you have to win this technical position over the board, it can go wrong. Right. And around that time, uh, uh, Nodirbeck was no longer completely lost, he was just worse. And then I thought, okay, who knows? At the moment that uh, uh, G6, Bishop F5 was basically played in a game between uh, Abdus Satarov and Gukesh, I was at that time, you know, very, very hopeful. Why? Because uh, position looked to me like uh, now about equal. And body language was clearly giving that Gukesh still thought that he was maybe no longer winning, but definitely better. Mm. Or anyhow, definitely not running a risk trying to win this kind of position. Once uh, this pawn on G2 fell, I was kind of actually then very optimistic that Black is going to win this game. Because, and uh, uh, Nodirbek showed his Carlsen-like skills there, yeah? Yeah. Yes, because at that time, uh, well, first of all, it is probably black is already better. Or if somebody is better, it is black. I didn't check what his computer saying. And also at that time, Gukash was actually getting into severe time pressure. And in such a crazy position when she, where you need actually to calculate many checks, both kings are open, you need time to right. handle this, this position. So this was maybe, let's say, the crucial moment we, because we were going back and uh, then we had a team meeting. I told them, look, don't worry. I don't know what is going to happen tomorrow, but I know that we will win a gold. Uh, and they asked me, how are you so sure? I said, look, uh, if you save such a match, this is a sign, you know, coming from above <laughs> that somehow something, because I said, look, if you save such a hopeless match, uh, it is... Uh, clearly a sign that this is your Olympiad. Absolutely. And what do you have to say about the support that they receive from the government? Like this time, they uh, like when Abdul Satarov had won, he got a house. Uh, this time, they were all given, I think, cash awards of 53,000 <laughs> euros. You yourself uh, received, I think, an award of 26,500 euros. How do you feel about the involvement of the government? Uh, look, government involvement is fantastic. Players have indeed received uh, this this money. This is correct, and I should receive this money as well. I'm flying uh, tomorrow to Tashkent. I think probably they would present me this reward or make a money transfer. I don't know what they would do. Hmm. Uh, but uh, regardless, this you know massive award on every team meeting. I was repeating myself at least ten times. Being promised a lot of money does not make you make better moves. Uh, the best way to get to this money is to win games. And games you win not by thinking about money, by thinking about position. And uh, involvement of government is fantastic. I think that, okay, uh, you have this a little bit, uh, you know, strange situation because... Uh, Let's say you have a, I would not say, you can say a rich or you can say, let's say, very economically developed country, like, for example, Netherlands. Uh, when we became uh, European champions in uh, 2005, which was massive results. We, we were, I mean, not rated number one, 
uh, we were maybe rated number five or six. And okay, Russia played, uh, Azerbaijan played, Armenia, Ukraine, all those countries uh, played. We won this uh, gold. We got flowers. And flowers. Nothing else, you know, they pat you on the shoulder, very well done. And uh, I would not say that you feel like idiot. You don't do not feel like idiot. But uh, in a current world which we live in, let's say uh, appreciation to success is connected to remuneration mm -hmm. in a business life, in a cultural life, into anywhere. Uh, so, if somebody pats you for a gold on a shoulder and says, oh, yes, well done, and gives you a bunch of flowers, the same person is maybe, let's say, working uh, for a multinational company and fighting very hard for his or her bonus because otherwise thinks my work is not valued enough. Mm. But then suddenly values your work in a different terms. Uh, in Uzbekistan... It is not obviously not a rich country because uh, average GDP is uh, considerably lower. But I think that they would love to have uh, sporting heroes. Sporting heroes as being an example to the youth. And it certainly helps that all those people are very young. And I think that they are willing to award it for two reasons. I think maybe reason number one that they really feel that this is a historical success, which should be rewarded. Also, I mean, Abdus Satarov at the age of 17 winning World Rapid is absolutely historical success, which should mm -hmm. be rewarded. And I think also maybe number two is to send a message to the rest of the population, do the same, and you will be rewarded. Which is okay, I think a good thing. And, you know, regardless the low GDP of the country and the award which those players got from the government, uh, okay, how many of those people do, do they have in the country that achieve such a massive success in any kind of sport? Not so many. You don't have it almost in any country, not so many. In any country in this world, including the biggest ones, you do not have like 100 people who won Olympic medal that year. Mm. Or Olympic gold that year. And they get rewarded this very small, very small part of people. So this reward given to them is not changing anything in a big picture for the rest of the population, which is only, I think, serving as a stimulus for a generation, younger generation in other sports, sports professionals. Okay, try to do the same. And you will be equally rewarded. Uh, the road is tough. It is not easy. But try to do it. Do you think that in Uzbekistan, all these talents sprouting out are happening out of, let's say, a, not an accident, but just as independent sort of talents? Or do you think there is a structured way and that this will continue in the future as well? Uh, I think it is structured way and it will probably continue. Because look, uh, when I came there, uh, I was very impressed by their chess academy. I don't know have, if you have ever been there. No. Okay, it is a massive building. Massive building which is having uh, many training rooms. It is having, I think, a gym. It is having uh, some sleeping room rooms uh, on the rooftop. I was all staying in a hotel. But Tiviakov, who was working with the ladies' team, was staying in one of those rooms. Uh, they have a huge park on the premises, which belongs to Academy. Uh, simply a huge building. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody told me that they are now planning, having somewhere on the plans on these premises or directly next to it to build a small sports hotel, something like this. So there is a structure, there is obvious structure. There is appreciation, like, for example, uh, uh, when uh, this gold medal was won and we came to hotel, Federation president picked up a phone and he called president of the country, who picked up a call and who spoke to a number of Uzbeki players. Mm. 
Uh, there are not so many countries where you achieve success and you just uh, pick up a phone and you call president of the country. Not so easy. Uh, normally you get maybe some minister at very mm. best. Mm. So I think that there is a structure. Uh, I don't know how many of, let's say, people who are now 12 or 13 how many do they have and what is their level because I honestly I did not investigate onto their results on a world uh, world youth or Asian youth I was just focused on these uh, five players which I got but I assume that uh, some younger talents uh, are coming I'm almost uh, sure though I didn't investigate there you have transformed the Iranian team as well, but would you call this as your biggest professional success as a trainer? Uh, it is similar. It is difficult to say because this is my biggest success as a trainer and the result. Absolutely sensational result. But on the other hand, in Iran, I had a situation that uh, when I came, I had this... Uh, I had one season grandmaster, which was uh, Ehsan, Kuhai Mahami, and I had a number of kids who were rated 2400. When I left uh, two years later, all those kids were 2600 plus. Mm. And this was uh, also massive success. Okay, not a gold medal, but we won, let's say, like uh, Asian teams. Mm which was at that time massive because uh, India played and China played. Okay, you may argue that maybe China and India did not play with the best teams, which is true, but they played with formidable players. And uh, these uh, young kids, uh, we managed to win those categories. Uh, probably my trainer's success uh, with the Salem when he won uh, Asian individual was also something that I'm proud of because uh, when I came to UAE, he was a young grandmaster, maybe 25, 50, 60. When I left, he was a uh, well, former Asian champion. And to win Asian championship is tough. Uh, mm. You may also argue that tournament that not all the best Asian players played, but many very good ones played. I think that Vidit played, uh, Sasi Kiran played, uh, Adhiban played, uh, also, a couple of very strong Chinese players, they played as well. Right. So, would you say that you like to take on these challenges as a trainer? Let's say now you have these strong players and you want to build them further. Would that be more interesting for you? Or would you like to go to another country which has these budding talents and then grow that? Uh, I think that it is always important to have a challenge. Like, for example, uh, for me, it, it was very good to... Uh, a situation because I knew that team was uh, based on analysis of some games. I knew the team was underrated. Mm. I knew that general expectation was not very high because the number of uh, very strong players said, well, to win a medal is zero chance. And I knew that there is a chance and I knew that there was that there could be, let's say, potential for a great surprise which then puts you in a very good good position working on it. Uh, those players are very young players. And if it is, uh, let's say, up to me, if everything goes very well with my, let's say, the work relationship with the uh, Uzbekistan Chess Federation, I would like to try to defend uh, uh, Olympic champions title mm -hmm. in a t two years from now. Uh, because uh, on one hand, team should be stronger because those are young players. But obviously, task will be more difficult. Because to win something or to defend it is uh, to defend it is a bit more difficult. Right. Uh, and then, okay, then who knows? You know, two years in a human life is a long time. 
Uh, by the way, since I have you now online and I didn't check it myself, next year is there Asian teams next year? Mm, I'm not sure, but I'll check and I'll let you know. Okay, because this is probably another going to be a interesting event for this team because uh, if in Asian teams all the teams come yeah. with the strongest teams, it will be difficult to win that event. Uh, Absolutely. As, as, as simple as it is. Because, uh, well, maybe China will come with its uh, strongest team. And, okay, India will be, will be stronger because it can come only with the one team. Uh, unless it is in India. I don't know. Then maybe you would have, again, uh, two or three teams. As of now, the Asian individual is going to be in India later this year. And yes. I think all these youngsters will travel to India, perhaps. That's what I believe. Yes, all of them uh, will will travel. This I know. They told me when they were getting a visa that, uh, okay, they were happy to get the multi-entry so that mm. they don't need to do it again. Absolutely. And lastly, I want to get your thoughts on the young Indian team as well, the youngsters in India. You have been uh, there. You must have got a bit of an idea. Gukesh, Nihal, Prague, Arjun, uh, Raunak. What are your feelings uh, about them? Uh, I think that Gukesh has the most potential. Not because he made uh, this, you know, crazy result, but because uh, 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 Pragananda and Nihal Sarin are, uh, for my taste, way too technical for their age. But okay, this is my personal opinion. Uh, what do you mean by technical? Like they are too sort of positional or? Uh, they like uh, to have a game, uh, if possible, uh, fully under control mm. all the time. And this is sometimes uh, not exactly possible. And I also, and I, I'm under the impression number of positions they let's say they don't venture because they like to have this kind of control feeling. Uh, I think that they have that they are technically unbelievably strong for somebody of their age. But on the other hand, uh, this uh, being focused on that kind of uh, style, though bringing a uh, steady success and improvement of rating can stand in a way of achieving something very, very high. Mm. Uh, Sadvani is still very young to give personal opinion. I know Sadvani very well. I even did have a few sessions with him. But I think that he's still very young. We have to see how would it develop. Uh, Eric okay. Aisi is, I think, is very good. Uh, uh, Rigaisi is uh, unbelievably good at uh, uh, taking advantage of opponent's mistakes. Mm. I think that this is his uh, strongest point. But, to, okay, this is a very strong point. Uh, so, uh, my opinion is that G Gukesh can come the furthest from this group. Be Amazing. Not only because of those games here, but obviously I was looking at their games uh, before from different tournaments. But well, this is my, uh, you know, opinion. I could be wrong. Absolutely. Uh, all, all of them are basically very strong. So this is not easy question. But uh, well, this is what I think. Yeah, and I appreciate your uh, insights here. And also amazingly, uh, amazing interview, I would say so many insights. And I want to Deeply congratulate you for your contribution to the Uzbek team. I think uh, you were that sort of glue which helped them raise their game and get the gold medal. So, huge congratulations. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Cheers.